Hi, I'm Brian Walby with Oringo, and today we're going to be talking about what you can do as an MBA applicant if your GMAT score is low. Uh, Oringo specializes in dealing with MBA applicants in that exact situation. And just before we get started, a little background on myself. I'm a graduate of the Kellogg School of Management and work with applicants for Oringo. So just a bit on the admission process uh, to start. The GMAT, of course, um, is, a, is a key factor, but it's, only, it's normally about a 20% weight in the admission, depending on the school. Also included in that, um, in the admission, of course, is your undergraduate GPA, your essays and recommendations, your interview, and your personal history and resume. Now, Ringo created this notion of admission drivers, which are critical factors that influence your admission. And they're based on conversation with admission committees, alumni, students, and analysis of past trends and application results. And examples of this would include things like leadership, communication, persuasion, teamwork, etc. Now the requirements that I mentioned up front, of course, influence those admission drivers. And in particular, your GMAT score influences the analytical skills admission driver, which is used, and the GMAT is really used as a proxy for your academic performance in business school as well as to an extent a proxy for your professional potential. Key takeaway from today's discussion is that if you have a low GMAT score, um, all is not lost. You still have a shot to be admitted into a, pro into a top program. To do that, you're going to need to provide additional context with um, content in your application with respect to your intellectual capacity to be able to improve on the analytical skills admission driver and also hit upon a well-rounded application. Just a little bit of background on the GMAT itself. You know, these days the average GMAT of admitted students into top programs is uh, measurably above 700, and you'd really like to be in any particular school within the uh, middle 80% band of matriculating students and your GMAT score to have a reasonable chance of admission. But a strong overall application uh, can overcome a weak GMAT, and case in point, if you look at Oringo.com, there's many examples of students listed who had low GMAT scores that were admitted into the top programs. So our main framework for today's discussion in terms of what you can do with a low GMAT score, we have three proposed areas for candidates to address. The first is to frame your intellectual aptitude with other objective measures. The second is to frame your academic experience as more rigorous than that of your peer group. And the third are actions that the, the applicant you can take prior to submitting your application itself. So the first of the three areas in our framework in terms of talking about your intellectual aptitude with other objective measures, what you want to try to do here is provide context, uh, typically as a percentile or rank within your peer group, and try to provide more recent results in your academic and professional history wherever possible. So the examples I'm going to talk about are in reverse chronological order for um, a potential career that, you might, that might be relevant to you. So things that you might want to highlight would include uh, topics such as were you selected to train colleagues at work or in a client setting based on your mastery of a subject? Uh, if you recently completed the professional certification in your area, like the PE professional engineer, uh, were you selected into your firm based largely in, on a case interview process or problem solving analysis, or was your firm particularly selective overall? Did you comp recently complete a, a professional exam where passing would allow you to practice uh, in your region, for example, the bar exam? Uh, grad other graduate school admission tests like the MCAT or the LSAT. Were you selected for merit-based scholarships, fellowships, or awards, or things like nominated uh, as a top student by your faculty in school, or were you selected to complete research with a faculty member? Um, college entrance exams, your IQ score, high school rank, and even if you skipped a grade, those are some of the things earlier on in your career that you can highlight. Okay, the second part of our framework is uh, talking about your academic experience as more rigorous than that of your peer group. And these are really hardships or complexities that forced you to manage your time in a way that others in your peer group did not face. And again, quantify to the extent possible, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into specifics. So for instance, in school, if you had an above average extracurricular load or significant work experience while in school, definitely provide the uh, hours per week that you are involved and really only stress this area significantly if you were, in, you were way above average relative to your peer group. Examples specifically could include things like if you started a business venture, you know, talk about the background there, the lessons learned, how you spawn the idea, etc. 
you work full time or part time uh, significantly, say 20 plus hours per week, and again, that's that much more impressive when fewer of your colleagues were in that same situation. Or military service, if you completed that while in school, as a that's a significant um, responsibility uh, as well, in addition to school. While in school, if you had a, a more challenging academic setting, you can frame that in one of the following ways, if true. If you graduated early, and it's, first of all, talk about that and elaborate why. Usually it's because you were either trying to pay back loans faster, or you were afforded a great professional opportunity. If you had a double major, which by definition meant that you had a heavier uh, academic workload in terms of average number of credits per term, and if you had a major that was considered among the hardest at your school. Uh, be careful with that last uh, example though. Admission committees already take into account to an extent what your major was, and they know, for example, that engineering was a, is a demanding major uh, in, at most schools. When you describe these circumstances that we've talked about so far, in the first two parts of our framework, you do not want to come off as, you're, as though you're complaining about your situation. Instead, you want to try to frame it in a factual, sort of positive way with the, with the lesson of, hey, this is what I took away from this experience, and this is, what, this is why it benefited me. So for example, if you had a lot of work experience in school, that might have improved your time management skills, for instance. So now in the first two parts of the framework, we've talked about a lot of ideas. How do you actually place these insights and implement them within your application itself. We believe that it's better to mention these inside your regular essays and CV instead of the optional essay for your application. The art though is to come off so that it's not forced into the story in your essays, but rather it's part more of a, of a natural flow. Now why do we say that we, you'd like to place them in, in your regular essays? Well, if you place it in the optional essay, it, it may appear that you're bringing excuses to the table when you don't want to actually do that. Um, mentioning the accomplishment that sort of belongs to the topic, so to speak, could actually have a, bit, a bigger impact on the reader from the standpoint that it's easier for them to remember facts that are part of a coherent flow as opposed to something separate from the rest of the application. So how do you actually place these in the essay, um, whether it's in the regular or the optional essays? In the regular essays, if it's talking about, or if you're talking about, for example, your, applicants, your, applicant, your background as an applicant, you could say something to the effect of, my childhood shaped the way who I am today, and then somewhere in that essay, talk about your high school distinction or SAT scores, if that was relevant and specific to you and your situation. Or if you're talking about your career progression, for example, you could say, one of the key decisions in, one, in my career in life was thinking about whether or not to pursue business or a law degree, my LSAT score placed me in the top 10% of, of students, but I ended up taking a job in, in the high-tech industry because of my interest in the company that offered me, for example. Within the optional essay, you don't want to just state whatever the, the contextual factors are. Instead, take a step back and give an introductory sentence like, I believe my GMAT does not accurately reflect my analytical skills, or I'd like to bring a few facts to the admission committee's attention that might help in evaluating these skills and then you succinctly go and describe the facts. Uh, the longer, frankly, that it takes you to explain, the more that it may look like you're bringing excuses to the table. So try to do it in a succinct way. Okay, so the third part of our framework is our actions that you as an applicant can take prior to actually submitting your application itself. You know, thus far we've talked about uh, things that are basically descriptive of your history. You really can't change them in the first two parts of our discussion. So this third part is really about being strategic in your planning, in how you select schools, and how you complete a well thought out application that will hopefully differentiate you. So some specific examples would include things like the following. First, completing and excelling in getting at least a B, if not hopefully an A, in a business related course. Uh, this is gonna somewhat improve the um, impression of the admission committee on your analytical skills, but it's not totally gonna over, um, address a low GMAT score. This is particularly relevant if your GMAT quant score is weak or if you're in a if you had an undergraduate major that was in a non-technical field or non-quantitative field like the humanities, for example. Obviously, make sure that your grade is available um, when you apply to business schools and take or consider taking a class in statistics, finance, or accounting because these are all uh, classes that you would take in the first year of an MBA program. And finally, try to take this, the the class to the extent that you can 
at an accredited and prestigious school or the, the, the most prestigious school that you can afford and have access to where you live. Second concept would be to actually retake the GMAT test itself. Uh, you're going to only, only want to do this though if you think that you can improve your score significantly, for example 30-40 points, or if you can get into the 700s, for example if you were just going from 690 to 700 having that 7 in front of your score, we in our prior research shows that that has a, a positive effect. Look at your practice test history to see where your scores were at relative to what your previous um, actual GMAT scores were. Uh, keep in mind that you might not actually improve very much and you may actually um, do worse in subsequent tests. Um, and finally, don't retake the GMAT if it's going to distract you from the rest of your applications if you're, if you're in the fall and into the application season. With your recommender's stories um, and what they talk about in, in, in their application for you, in your resume, during your interviews, in your essays, um, all that combined, if you've got a low quant split on GMAT and or if you've got a non-technical background, think about telling a higher proportion of stories in those, those uh, areas that I gave that are linked to you mastering a subject or talking about your analytical skills and problem solving or you getting up to speed on a complex issue. Conversely, if you've got a low verbal GMAT score and, and or especially if you've got a technical background, tell, think about talking about a higher proportion of stories that are linked to you and your leadership skills and your communication and your presentation and your persuasion. And the idea here is that you really want to try to overcome the biases that admission committee members may already have about you given your GMAT score and your academic and your work history. Don't, another, another concept, don't just research the school, uh, go beyond researching the school and develop relationships to prove interest, uh, to prove that sincere interest. You know, you can develop meaningful alumni and student relationships and hopefully you, you'd want to try to do that in a way that is with people who have multiple similarities in terms of your background that'll be easier to build rapport that way both ways. Because these people could become and can become champions for your advocacy uh, and they can help to some extent with your chances. You know, Aringo has developed some expertise and guidelines for, for applicants and how to navigate this process. And as a separate point within this overall idea, mentioning these relationships and what you discussed in the communications within and inside your essays um, can help to convince schools that you do have a sincere interest in their program and help your chances. From a career goal standpoint in your essays and any application overall, you want to be articulating goals for a career that are specific, that are realistic, that are exciting, and that are differentiated. You want to hit on all of those. You know, many MBA applicants are career switchers and they talk about exciting career goals. And that's perfectly fine and it's frankly expected. The challenge though, and a common mistake that we see with a number of applicants is that if you list exciting goals but you don't provide enough specifics, or if you don't provide a logical link to the past, it's hard for the committee to think to, it's hard for the committee to believe that you've thought through this enough and that it's a, it's a believable, realistic shot for your career. So instead, consider plans that you're interested in and write about career plans that do have some connection with your past, whether it's industry or function or skills that you might bring to the table that are relevant for that career field, for them, for the admission committee to make that and for them to be uh, thinking that's more realistic for you. Be specific. Talk about specific companies, specific industries and sub-industries, geographies and functions um, that you've, based on your research, that would describe why it's a fit with you and your background. From a strategy standpoint in picking schools and where to apply, target schools to the extent possible that have a relatively small percentage or proportion of applicants where the background or characteristics of applicants is similar to you. Uh, and choose a mix of schools that are across the rankings that you would still consider um, attending. For example, if you're an engineer and you've got a low GMAT score and you're, attend you're uh, looking to apply to MIT Sloan, which has a very high number of engineering ap applicants relative to the number of spots, it's going to be difficult, not impossible, but difficult for you to get admission because it's going to be harder for you to differentiate yourself with that low GMAT score. So therefore, research the demographic and geographic and industry makeup of schools and their classes to understand where you may have an opportunity. Now, we're not saying to give up on a dream school or a set of dream schools, but just apply or consider applying across a reasonable uh, uh, range of rankings of schools that you'd consider attending 
to give you an improved um, admission shot. Again, on the selecting and targeting schools topic, um, go ahead and try to target schools if you can, if you've got a low GMAT, that place relatively low or lower weight on the GMAT itself. Now you might be asking, well, that's great, but what are those schools that have that lower weight? On Oringo.com, you can find out how much um, importance each admission driver of the multitude of admission drivers has on, um, on each program, for example, on the analytical skills or communication. And you'll also find application tips for each program. Just within Oringo.com, you'll want to click on the Top Programs button to find some of that information. A few closing remarks. You know, obviously, every applicant and his or her story is unique. Focus on the key issues that are most relevant to you, your background, your history, and your story. Today, to deal with a low GMAT score, we've talked about additional intellectual accomplishments and undergraduate context that you can provide, along with this notion of providing superior essays and recommendations and interviews done in a strategic way in your application. To, pr to provide uh, um, further information if you're interested or to discuss your admission chances uh, with an Oringo expert who's got a background similar to you, please contact us at Oringo.com. I want to thank you very much for watching today and best of luck with your applications.